public employees for environmental responsibility next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. The subject, public employees for environmental responsibility. It's an enormously important group based in Washington, D.C., and it represents a local level, a state level, a federal level, those folks in public employee trying to preserve, to protect the environment. And I'm just reading here from a statement from PEER, that's the acronym, these frontline employees stand as defenders of the public interest within their agencies and as the first line of defense against the exploitation and pollution of our environment. With us is Jeff Rook. He's the executive director of PEER. Jeff, welcome. How did PEER get started? PEER got started as a union between a whistleblower support organization called the Government Accountability Project and a group working with Forest Service employees called Forest Service Employees for Environmental Ethics. And the union was to try and take the idea of how to protect activists within the agency beyond just one agency, the Forest Service. And out of that, Peer was born, and our somewhat awkward name was constructed to produce the acronym Peer, which for a watchdog group is a, a good message, but it also is meant to convey equality, as in, the specialists within the agency have a place at the table. Staff isn't spelled with a PH, that political appointees do not get to dictate reality. And so our job is to be at their service. We're a service organization for biologists, rangers, attorneys, inspectors working in these agencies across the country. You have all kind of things going. You have campaigns going, uh, all sort of literature we'll get into that you guys you folks put out, do you have litigation, particularly involving whistleblowers? Let's talk about your whistleblower sure. program. Um, first of all, we're a service organization, so we, we act as sort of a shelter for battered staff. And people come to us with problems. And sometimes they need help with uh, their own personnel situation. Sometimes it's an agency dysfunction. Sometimes it's exposing something uh, that's an underlying issue that, not, isn't, that transcends their agency. In many instances, uh, people that get in trouble with the agency, in some cases they're classic whistleblowers and they're trying to disclose something, but more commonly they're people that are just doing their jobs. In many instances, the specialists, particularly scientists, are so dedicated to what they're doing, they usually aren't paying attention to the internal agency politics and they don't notice the wind shifting behind them. And suddenly, something they've been doing for 20 years becomes institutionally inconvenient and when it dawns on them that their own chain of command is the problem, that's when they call us. And so in those instances, we, as we say, we lawyer up and we um, use what tools we can to preserve their careers and give them new career options. Let's get to some specific examples. Teresa Chambers, talk about what became a big case. Uh, an extraordinary case. So this was, um, the, she was the first female chief of the U.S. Park Police, chosen by the Bush administration following a nationwide search in 2002 in the wake of 9-11 to modernize a constabulary that had been founded by President George Washington. So she'd been on the job for a little more than a year, and um, one of the consequences of 9-11 was that Secretary Norton, at the time Interior Secretary Norton, had ordered redoubled shifts of uniformed officers on the National Mall. Well, that drew officers out of the parks and parkways, the, the U.S. Park Police in Washington, D.C. area is responsible for an awful lot of what is considered green in the nation's capital. So the union went to the Washington Post with documents that they had gotten that showed that basically um, what had been double patrols on the parkways were now single patrols. An officer had died uh, in part as a result of that and a number of other problems. So Teresa Chambers, was, Chief Chambers, was ordered by the Interior Department to um, meet with a Washington Post reporter, as most good reporters do before they write. They'll go into the front door and ask the agency, of, here's what we have, what, what's your reaction? So she was there with her press secretary, 
And she didn't think she could tell them a lie. She confirmed all of this and explained they were doing the best that they could, but that um, without additional resources, there were going to be lapses. She thought she had done a delicate job deftly and thought she was going to be rewarded, actually. But two days later, she was called into the director of the Park Service's office, and the director wasn't there, but the deputy was with two armed security guards. And there she was stripped of her badge and gun, her identification, given a cardboard box to collect her possessions, and then marched out onto the street. And that began what was almost an eight-year saga. They put her on paid administrative leave and ordered her not to say anything. Um, and we came to represent her, and by the time we filed an appeal, the two days after we filed the appeal, they decided to terminate her. And among the reasons they uh, chose to terminate her was her disclosure of law enforcement sensitive information, which was disclosing what the union had given to the Washington Post. Um, and there wasn't anything sensitive about that. In any event, um, as a function of really how bad the civil service justice system works, it took a long time to fully vindicate her. And so we finally won a complete victory. She was ordered, restored with all back pay. Uh, and she was sworn in again by the Obama administration on January 31st, and she's again the chief of the U.S. Park Police. Happy ending. Heather Wiley, another example. Well, and before, before I leave, one of the things that we found extraordinary was we could not get the Obama administration to restore chief chambers. We had to litigate for more than two years against the Obama administration in a case which, during the uh, 2008 campaign, they had pointed to as an example of the abuses of the Bush administration. And so it's been somewhat disappointing and surprising that um, in these instances, because what the Chambers case was about was whether or not a civil servant could lose their career for being honest. And despite the victory that she won, as a general principle, honesty is still a firing offense. Let me just jump into that right away before we get to Heather Wiley. The conventional wisdom is Things were terrible, terrible, terrible under George W. Bush. Barack Obama becomes president. Things have vastly improved. Do you find in representing and helping, assisting these idealistic and honest public employees involved in environmental work that there is a big, big difference between administrations? There is a difference, but not as much as you would suspect. There's a, certainly a surface dif difference. but. The Obama governance style, we call it a leading by aspiration and not perspiration. So there'll be a lofty memo, but they'll leave the same managers and the same internal policies in place. And when you get the same results, they act like they're surprised. Nobody read the memo. Um, so there hasn't been an attempt to sort of undo a lot of the damage that's been done. And um, it's the Obama administration, they remind me of the janitor that says, I don't do windows. They're the government that doesn't do personnel. And so trying to get officials to react to individual cases, they were saying, well, we're just going to let it play out. Whereas under the Bush administration, regardless of what was going on with them, you could always find somebody who was a responsible official who would negotiate, and often when they were in completely ridiculous situations, would back off. We just haven't, we haven't found that. Okay. Heather Wiley, that story. Uh, th that was actually one of the more interesting cases. Heather was a biologist for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers which has many duties with respect to waterways in the United States. And a U.S. Supreme Court decision has thrown this area of the Clean Water Act, protection of wetlands, into complete uproar. And now there has to be a complete redefinition as to what are protected waters under the Clean Water Act. And the river that was at issue is the L.A. River, which is the river that most people know because it's a scene for car chases. It's a concrete, channelized river that runs through L.A., but actually is a real river. And Heather, as a biologist, had done an awful lot of work in the L.A. River and knew that her agency was going to rule against uh, protections for the river. So on a Saturday with a local group, she got in a kayak, and they kayaked the length of the L.A. River. Unbeknownst to her, it was filmed, and it ended up on YouTube. This is sort of the only thing that can happen today. And somebody sent a YouTube clip to her chain of command. And the Army Corps of Engineers, for whatever uh, qual other qualities they have, sense of humor is not one of them. And so they decided that Heather needed to be punished. And so they gave her, a, a, proposed to give her um, a very long suspension that would have in essence ended her career and made it difficult for her to get federal employment. So she was referred to us by environmental groups. That's where we get an awful lot of our clients is from other environmental groups. And we uh, made the case that 
by demonstrating with the kayak, she was engaged um, in constructive speech, in, in symbolic speech. This was a First Amendment case. And so we also made sure that the story, which was quite photogenic, and Heather was a five-foot-tall blonde woman who's quite attractive, ended up on the front page of the LA Times. And the core saw the better part of wisdom in settling the case and um, allowing a settlement that was quite acceptable to Heather, who uh, decided to go on to law school. But, but, but most importantly was that the Heather's action triggered the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to come in and overrule the core. And late last year in 2010, EPA declared the L.A. River navigable and thus protected by the Clean Water Act. Another happy ending. I mean, it's just wonderful that you, you're there for these folks to go to. Um, they're the heroes, and we're sort of, we're the stem and they're the flower. We're the lever. Uh, we're, we know we occupy a, a niche within the environmental community. We're sort of a, a, a very specific role in the biodiversity of the environmental movement. And from our point of view, public employees are an incredibly important strategic constituency. We figure there's about a quarter million people, specialists that are working in pollution control, natural resource, and public health agencies. And in our experience, tens of thousands of them feel they're not being allowed to do their job. So if we can help a portion of them do their job, we think we make a big contribution. Scientific integrity, another big area, and one of the, uh, the, oh, the major components of that, that area has been the impacts of offshore oil drilling and whether the, the federal government is being honest about what occurs when you drill for oil, uh, bill uh, would perhaps be a drill, uh, maybe spill. Yeah, that's right. Well, and the first sort of just by way of overview, one of the problems is that science within government agencies is considered by the law a matter of opinion. For the most part, the content of science and the scientists themselves have no legal protection. It's rare for a scientist to be in a position where they're covered by uh, whistleblower protections. And thanks to the Supreme Court, Samuel Alito's first swing decision in 2005, I think it was, the court ruled that government employees at all levels are not covered by the First Amendment at all when they're speaking within the scope of their duties. Usually the First Amendment is a balancing test between disruption and the importance. What the court ruled as a matter of constitutional analysis was Public employees are not part of the balance at all when they're speaking within the scope of their duties. And so for the most part, scientists are always speaking within the scope of their duties. It's not like they're the ones that usually are going out on street corners or doing things like that. So for scientists within these agencies, they're often operating within a legal no man's land. And one of the questions that was asked uh, about the Bush administration, which became notorious for manipulating science, was how could they get away with it? And the answer was there are no rules against it. And unfortunately, there still aren't rules against it, and that's why it's still going on. And one of the things you're doing is pushing for what do you call it, transparency? And integrity codes. And one of the differences is that President Obama did pledge to adopt those in March of 2009. They were supposed to have been in place by July of 2009, and here it is, and we're approaching the middle of 2011, and there's still nowhere to be seen. And in a lot of these agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency and NOAA, they're, they're sort of on the ground floor. They're, they haven't even really begun. And so those agencies remain under the same legal climate, and in many cases the same exact managers as under the Bush administration. Well, that's not personnel. What's the problem in terms of that in the Obama administration? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I often get the impression w when I talk to people connected with the White House where they complain about pushback from the agencies. And for whatever their faults, we never heard that complaint from the Bush folks. They never complained about pushback from the agencies. Dick Cheney made sure that things got done. And so the style has been, rather than a commander-in-chief, we have a committee chairman-in-chief. And before action moves to finality, there has to be a consensus. Well, in the question of science, what's really going on is a fight for the balance of power within the agency. The way it works now is almost like a kingdom. The political appointee can rule, and woe be to those that disobey. So people can be, uh, regardless of the merits of what they're saying, and, and in many cases the reason that these specialists get in trouble is precisely because they're right. It's, they're, it's so irritating that they're right. Uh, but the merits of what they say is no defense. Uh, putting rules in place that say that the scientific information that the agency must use 
should be accurate actually is revolutionary because that's not the case. And that's what the Obama administration has pledged. And right now there's a lot of, I'm, I would call it cubicle to cubicle fighting because if these rules are in place, it means the people with the pencil protectors have some status. They can't be told to change day to night or red to white. Let's jump to public health. I mean, that is a bottom line concern for a lot of people. Is it going to make us sick? Is it going to kill us? Something that's happening and the government is supposed to protect us from some of these things. But in fact, I mean, one of the cases that you've been involved with involves the EPA promoting, do I have it right, coal dust? Coal ash. Coal ash. Explain all that. Um, well, the biggest waste stream in the United States is waste from coal mining itself. The second biggest waste stream is the combustion, often called products, but it's really combustion wastes. What you stop from going up the smokestack of these coal-fired power plants. And it's about 120 million tons a year. Well, um, there's a big fight about what to do with this. Um, and a couple of years ago, there was a massive spill of coal ash sludge from these lagoons in Tennessee that wiped out an entire area and poisoned a river. That's sort of a small sample of this waste stream. The industry had hit on the notion of, I guess, making lemon out of lemonade, that if we could take these wastes and treat them as a product and sell them, then it was a win-win, as they say, because you, you, you make money off it. They now make about $15 billion a year off of it, and you avoid the cost of treating it as a hazardous waste. These uh, combustion waste, of the main which is coal ash, are not regulated at all, and the coal industry has fought bitterly against attempts by EPA to regulate. So um, in 2003, the industry convinced EPA to sponsor a partnership with the industry called the Coal Combustion Product Partnership, or C2P2, whose mission was to promote the sale of coal ash. So today, coal ash is in carpet backing, wallboard, kitchen counters, cosmetics. Um, it's also used as agricultural soil amendments. It's used in feeding troughs of animals, as well as in a whole variety of construction uses. And the problem with this, among the problems, uh, is that it's incredibly toxic. The reason we spend billions of dollars to prevent it from going up the smokestack is that it's some of the nastiest stuff you'll find. But the idea that if you put it in powder form that it therefore is benign is just nuts. And it becomes even more dangerous as the pollution controls get stricter. So there's a new generation of pollution controls that is going to dramatically lower the levels of mercury going up the smokestack. That means the levels of mercury in the resultant coal ash is going to be that much higher. So there's no regulation. EPA is in a partnership with industry to promote its use as beneficial use because it avoids it ending up in a lagoon in Tennessee. EPA specialists came to us and in essence said, it's sort of like the left arm doesn't know what the right arm is doing. Our solid waste people believe that recycling of anything is good. We're the toxicologists and the public health people we're putting all this stuff into the stream of commerce and it eventually reaches our water and uh, we have direct exposure to it. So things like uh, carpet backing. When old carpet is destroyed, it's often incinerated. So the stuff you prevented from going up the smokestack goes up the smokestack when you get rid of the carpet. It's, it's completely nuts. And it's an example of where EPA, despite current claims that decision making is science based, it's incredibly political. And so these are the sort of issues that EPA even refuses to address. We were able, through a number of different tactics guided by employees, to get EPA to suspend C2P2. But in suspending it, they sort of grudgingly said, our underlying beliefs about the beneficial uh, use of reuse of coal ash haven't changed. Wow. Wildlife and natural resource protection, one of the areas of great concern has to do with uh, uh, genetically modified, uh, well, explain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, our national wildlife refuge system um, consists of several hundred um, preserves across the United States, most of which are on uh, the great three flyways of the United States. And many of these um, refuges were initially carved out of farmland. And as sort of part of a political uh, quid pro quo to, to make the, the uh, federal presence more palatable, uh, in many instances, farmers were allowed to continue to farm on portions of the refuge land. 
Well, over time, um, as genetically engineered or modified crops, GE crops became more common, if, increasingly, if you're growing corn in the United States, 80% of the corn is GE corn. And if you're growing soybeans, it's 90-some percent. So to accommodate the farmers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, whose job is to run these refuges for wildlife, uh, increasingly sort of looked the other way. Even though they had a policy that said, you're only supposed to use genetically engineered crops if it's absolutely necessary to accomplish a refuge purpose. And it's never absolutely necessary to accomplish a refuge purpose. So we sued and forced the Fish and Wildlife Service, and this is under Obama, to suspend uh, the use of GE crops and national wildlife refuges in the Northeast. Um, they wouldn't agree to do it nationally. And it turned out that there's sort of been a legal counterattack because um, one of the president's central pledges is to increase U.S. exports. American crops are a big part of our export package and a good portion of them are GE crops. Well, representatives from the State Department and the U.S. Trade Representative had been coming back to the Fish and Wildlife Service to complain that people in Europe and South America are pointing out that uh, the American policies don't allow these GE crops on their nature preserves. Why should we accept them unquestionably? So right now there's been an effort, they've given up on the Northeast to basically cement them into the Midwest, the Rocky Mountain, and the Southeast. And that's going to be uh, a large part of what we're going to be doing in 2011. Another campaign involves the speed of ships so they don't hit right whales. Explain that, what right yeah, whales. See, that's one where we, we won, and that's, that's over. Uh, a good portion of the whale mortality comes from what are called ship strikes. Um, and the northern Atlantic right whale, which is highly endangered, there are only a couple hundred left in the world, it's one of the most endangered creatures, is apparently particularly vulnerable to ship strikes, which is one of the reasons that I guess they are so endangered. They tend to stay on the surface, um, and they're apparently not the most aware of beasts. And so uh, ships moving at high speed, in many instances, hit whales and don't even know it. Uh, there have been, usually the way that ship strikes are evidenced, and we have pictures on our website, is that ships come into harbor with a whale pinion on the, on the bow, because they don't know. The ships are so big and they're moving so fast, uh, this is, is not even a speed bump. And so the point of this that was brought to us by NOAA uh, marine biologists was the right whale has a migratory path, and it's known, and it can be avoided. And that if you're crossing the path during very limited times of the year, you should slow down. And so we work with them to develop a campaign to uh, enact uh, course corrections and speed limits to protect the right whale. And it would have been fully accomplished in 2007, but for the intervention of Vice President Cheney, who delayed it, but they were eventually finally put in place. The larger problem with ship strikes still remains, though. Not just people who work for government in the environment at the local and state and federal level can support peer. I mean, an average viewer out there, how could she or he get involved in supporting your very well, critical work? The same way that public employees do it. They can go to our website. There's a place to donate, um, and um, we take contributions. And in many instances, citizens, particularly those in environmental organizations, uh, bring public employees to us. Mo most organizations like the Sierra Club or Environmental Defense that are working on critical organizations have their inside contacts. And what often happens is that, particularly on an issue of controversy, that contact will hold up the smoking gun and say to the Sierra Club, if I give this to you, what happens to me? And that's when they call peer. Why this government dysfunction, which has been going on for so long and doesn't really, well, apparently dramatically change from administration to administration? What's, what's your your take on that? Um, what we often see is, and we're looking at these agencies from the underside as guided by the people inside the agencies. It's not the agencies themselves. They're acted on by political pressure. It's political appointees in Congress and the, their own executive branch that are ordering them to change things. Um, a, sort of a classic example, and this is one of the scientific integrity examples, is the scientists in the Fish and Wildlife Service did a 300-page study on the Gunnison prairie dog in which they recommended that it should be listed under the Endangered Species Act. The political appointee sent an email that said, and this is almost an exact quote, 
on PD dog change pause to neg. So the direction from the political appointee was, you can leave all 300 pages, just change the conclusion. And that's the sort of scenario that we deal with on a daily basis. In, in some of these agencies that um, create some of the most havoc, like the Army Corps of Engineers, their specialists are among the most top-notch, dedicated people that we work with, no disrespect to any of the others. But in many instances, when they make a call that is um, up against the force of political winds, um, their calls are reversed. Are the political winds connected to corporate power? Almost always. We often joke that um, there's not really so much a Republican and a Democratic Party. The, the major party of the United States is the Green Party. It's Mr. Green. It's, it's about money. The sort of situations that we deal with are a multi-million dollar politically connected project whose fate turns on the biological opinion of a 27-year-old field biologist who's operating with no support from his agency. That, those are the kind of cases that we get. And I sort of believe there were good old days, partly because the level of money wasn't so high, but because the norms and ethics in these agencies would have provided support to that biologist so that things today are, would have been unthinkable then. So when I first work, started to work in state government, um, Ronald Reagan was leaving California and Jerry Brown was coming in. Jerry Brown kept Ronald Reagan's director of fishing game because fishing game wasn't political. It was guys with short haircuts and uh, wore boots and sort of handled fish and game issues. There was, there was nothing political about it. By the time Jerry Brown left, uh, not so much because of him, but just because of sort of the change of the background, um, his successor um, put in the first political appointee and there have been political appointees ever since. Now among, well, the information available through peer to, to viewers out there, you have all kind of publications, you have peer mail, uh, you have white papers, you have book. Talk about this educational outreach because people have to be aware of, of, of what's been going on and is going on. We call it the information laundromat in the sense that um, we are contacted by specialists all over the country and at different levels of government and their request of us, the service they're asking of us is get this document out there, put it out on the line. And so what we do is figure out some sort of way to wash off the identifying fingerprints and put it up on the web so that everyone can see it, often in connection with an administrative petition or something that forces the agency to be confronted with it and have to explain itself. If people were more aware, do you think that big change can come? Sure. I mean, our, in, our, in our experience, the problems arise when uh, the actions are taken behind closed doors. Our operational definition of reform is that if anything that happens inside one of these agencies can and likely will end up on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow and they don't know how it got there, that's reform. If these agencies have to operate within the light of day, you don't have these kind of sleazy uh, behind the scenes things going on. And so that to some extent is, is our role, is to help the public peer into these agencies. Thank you, Jeff Rook, for the very good work of peer. And thank you for watching. This has been Carl Grossman. And visit our website for information about other Enviro close-ups. We're at www.envirovideo.com.